that'll do it. <laughs> you don't have to worry about me. You do not have to worry about me. <laughs> so, I've always been firmly of the belief that costuming is for everyone, just like these hands. And I've always kind of found it funny, or not funny, haha, -ha, but uh, rather interesting that even though most of modern fashion is really preoccupied with vintage aesthetics and the sort of nostalgic view of the past, it's always somehow upsetting to certain types of people when black women engage in this. If you've ever seen content from like a black woman cosplayer or a historical costumer or anyone just really into like vintage antique clothing, you might notice that they get a lot of strange comments from, again, certain types of people about how like this is like completely offensive you would have been a slave or like what's wrong with you why are you romanticizing a time when you wouldn't have had rights etc um and it's so funny because it's like one hearing that from any sort of modern consumer is always hilarious because it's like you probably wear like h&m or shein and stuff but does that mean you are appreciative of slave labor does that mean you agree with human rights violations probably not Sometimes the the magic of clothing is just about like how you get to interpret it for yourself and how you fashion your body and the image you like to project. And there's obviously this common saying, I like the costume community, vintage style, not vintage values. And that not in the case of everyone is this desire to uh, live in a certain time era or look like a certain period, necessarily this deep desire to return to apartheid or Jim Crow. Um, but when i first got into costuming i would go out of my way to try and find depictions of black people and black women especially in like positions of power as royalty nobility or just not being depicted in that subservient lens in order to prop up a white figure and i mean i've kind of evolved past the need to justify my hobby like this now but it does bring me to the reason for today's video which is one of the first um european artworks i found that depicted a black woman beautifully and gracefully and not as a slave or a servant but as equal to the white person she was um, posed next to in the image and that is this portrait of dido elizabeth bell with her cousin lady marie dido has been on my to make list for over two years and i've started doing a bit more research now that i've decided to make it today and the dress she's wearing is an 18th century wrapping gown based on kimonos from Japan and Indian jammers as according to the Georgian obsession with the Orient. And as I've been thinking about it and looking at stuff, I don't necessarily see Dido wearing this so much as her sort of ascribing to the 18th century um, obsession with Asian culture and Asian cultural appropriation. I in fact think it's actually a little bit more subversive than that. And I think there's actually something a little bit like pro-black about it and a little bit rebellious and cheeky. One theory is that Dido has maybe been dressed in clothes that aren't her own to highlight some kind of exoticism. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of debate on whether the painter are choosing to render Dido in this dress, something that in this time wouldn't have been worn as like everyday wear, but rather costume or fancy dress or masquerade. Um, and so there's this idea that perhaps it was to illustrate like her outsider status to perhaps like exoticize her, especially she, as she fulfills a role and a station that's pretty much virtually unheard of for a non-white person in this period. And we assume she was put into that to make a contrast, but she might have chosen it. So I'm not really going to get into like a lengthy discussion about Orientalism in this time. One, because I don't really know enough. Two, because I have a whole new point to bring up. I haven't really seen anyone make any sort of connection from the uh, media I've interacted with about how the stress and this whole entire look that Dida's wearing might actually be connected to her African heritage. I do understand that the Sultana directly pulls from Eastern aesthetics, but like when you look at it doesn't it also kind of remind you of like the kind of kaftans and robes and boo-boos that are both prominent in like asia and africa which is like mm, maybe this is another point for blasia actually <laughs> and perhaps it's probably because that she styled it with a turban or a head wrap and again head wrapping is present in both african and asian cultures especially in this time so my head canon my little little theory has become that if Dido did have agency over how she was going to be represented in this portrait, if she did get to choose her own clothes and how she was going to be painted, then perhaps this is actually 
like not so much a case of her being exoticized or just put in something weird but maybe it's a cheeky little nod to her ancestry that perhaps this portrait isn't this kind of show of fetishism but like a really subtle proclamation of maybe her blackness and when i look at the contemporary illustrations and paintings of and featuring black and mixed race women in this time you do often see them in head wraps and turbans and i do feel like perhaps i would like to think the data would have seen some of these things and i think at least on the surface there's like this sort of kinship between dido's dress and the way that we see free and enslaved black women and women of color in this time dressing in places like the caribbean and america and maybe this is a bit of a reach or, for, or wishful thinking but i do feel like there are these like recurring motifs and patterns and trends um, that you see across free and enslaved women in this time and this like these trends extend from the caribbean and the united states and even all the way down south as in africa as in the dutch cave colony and before anyone starts to yell at me please don't i understand that i'm always on the hunt for information and insight into the practices construction and materials of historical african fashion particularly anything in southern african especially if it exists pre-colonialism and if you have any i would love to see it but you might be surprised to learn that this isn't easy to find and of course there are some probably maniacal cynical bad reasons why that might be the case and probably some of the other reasons are just things getting lost to time um so in order to try and glean this information my approach has been to start with what's available and obviously there's a plethora of records and depictions by europeans of their time in african colonies or meeting the natives and i've gone through things like diary entries and anthropological studies and history books hoping that there was some detailed information about how the people they encountered looked like which led me to my previous videos discussion about sumptuary laws and conspicuous consumption in the cape colony in that video obviously i was discussing the dress and the material culture of white settler women but fortunately it did lead me to learning a little bit about the fashions of free and enslaved women of color in the cape and prior to this, my biggest point of reference for what enslaved and free black women might have looked like had been just turning to the records available for the women in the Americas and the Caribbean, just because that information is a lot easier to find. I do kind of have the suspicion that there are some universal aspects to black culture. And obviously, like in contemporary times, that's easier to see because of like mass media and the fact that we can all engage and build communities online and across over distance but considering that a lot of enslaved people were taken from africa and then transported to the caribbean or any of the americas or to europe a lot of them did obviously still hold on to bits and pieces of their cultural practices that they were practicing in africa and obviously these would have evolved with the changing circumstances and also in the continent they changed as well but some things still managed to stay and i also feel like there's also this like unifying power or this unifying yeah there is this unifying power that happens when black people are also put in positions of like being marginalized and oppression and there are these sort of like similarities that you see across the world in the ways that they sort of like combat their struggle building an entire story around clothing is what i'm really trying to do fashion is something that we have in common with people of the past especially in the african-american community someone wanting a new pair of shoes in the 19th century is the same sentiment today i want to look good plus also there are really great black woman costumers and historians like cheney mcknight of not your mama's history doing a lot of work in that field to sort of uncover the practices that African people held on to once they were, you know, forced into slavery in the Americas and stuff. And while I haven't found any pictorial evidence of what fashion might have looked like for free and enslaved women in the Cape, but there is some tree legislation at the time that does at least shed light on what they had access to and what they were engaging to and what they were eventually restricted and prohibited from. And oh, I guess I should quickly explain a few things about slavery and racialization in the Cape at this time. 
So enslaved people in the context of the Cape Colony refers to people of both like Asian and African descent who were brought into the Cape. So generally African enslaved people were often from Mozambique or Guinea and Angola, whereas like the Asian people were from Malaysia and Indonesia and India and such on. And then there's also free black people in this time, which could also describe people of Asian or African descent who were people that were manumitted from slavery. And that just means that they were emancipated from slavery while slavery was still legal and operating at the time of their emancipation. So it's not necessarily mass scale emancipation. So these were like a small group of individuals who um, were able to enjoy like rights or not having to be like indentured servants. And in my previous video, I explained how accessible upward socioeconomic mobility was for white settlers in the Cape. But what I didn't know at the time of that video, at the time of recording at least, was that this could also be the case for um, some African people too. In fact, actually something interesting that I found out was that the mother of the man who basically like founded Constantia Wines, as in like Constantia Wines, was actually a free black woman who became not just one of the wealthiest Africans in the colony, but like one of the wealthiest people in the colony across racial lines. And she was Zwata Maria Evert, and she was the daughter of two Angolan or Guineas, people from Guinea, um, two Angolan or Guineas enslaved people. I should probably double check how to say that. Her father, Evert van Guinea, had been given his freedom by Jan van Riebeek in 1659. And I guess, unfortunately, as a reward for assisting van Riebeek with controlling or capturing other West African enslaved people, he received land and was able to leverage that into very profitable farms and a really profitable business. And Zawata Maria, who would basically go on to like establish Camps Bay, she'd become one of the first sort of land loaners in Camps Bay. She learned a lot about business and making deals and buying property from him. And she became this really wealthy and apparently really well-liked figure in the Cape. And what's really interesting is her name's also Zawata because apparently she was so dark-skinned. And I think it's really interesting that this was her reception of her at the time. And I think perhaps race wasn't so strictly like... Or it wouldn't evolve to what it would become like later on in the 19th century. But Zawata Maria is definitely a story that deserves its own video. She led a really interesting life that includes like multiple marriages, getting arrested and possibly like poisoning one of her husbands. And maybe my next like sewing project or my next video will be a reimagining of maybe what she would have worn. Because I have really always wanted to do something like 1600s, like 17th century fashion doesn't get enough attention and it's really cool. But anyways, the point of that is that Zwarte's proof of some of the, the wealth, the luxury, the mobility that free black women could have enjoyed at this time. And not that all of them did, but that it was a reasonable possibility. Moreover, the 1765 Sumptuary legislation reveals that free black women were prohibited from wearing colored silk, hoop skirts, fine laces, adorned bonnets, earrings with gems or imitation gems and curled hair. And I'm not really sure how they enforced that last one because you know, but I'd imagine it probably went something like the Tignon laws, which required women of African descent in Caribbean and American colonies to wear head wraps because like they were just going absolutely bonkers, like styling their hair. And you know, the girls were mad, they were jealous. And in fact, actually the style of head wrap that you see in Augustino Brunia's paintings was actually called the Tignon. And I think it's absolutely marvelous and so cool and so big. And I think even these kind of head wraps would get prohibited later on because again, like the girls had them gagged. And yeah, this law is always really hilarious because it came about because the like Spanish colonial authorities felt that African women had quote unquote, too much luxury in their bearing. And I think it's really funny that they came up with this law to make them cover their hair because at the same time, one of the beauty trends for European women in this time was appropriating these very same band hairstyles. And you just gotta love like a really full circle moment here. Also, I think too much luxury in their bearing is a recurring theme when it comes to how African people like live and behave under colonialism. In the Cape Colony, the aforementioned sumptuary laws came from this like settler panic that through their dress, free black women were, quote unquote, them placing themselves not only on par with other respectable burger wives, but often push themselves above them. The idea that like, I guess it was like this idea that like black women could and would outdo them was just really unseemly and vexing to the public. <laughs>
And I guess because it's really difficult to feel superior to someone who's in a better outfit than you. Like, what if you accidentally end up respecting them? Like, what if you actually appreciate their sleigh? What if you, as two queens, come together, you maximize your joint cut? Can I say that on YouTube? Probably not. It's a really, but the point is, it's like a really slippery slope to human rights, you know? So eventually what happens is that black women were only limited to wearing uh, chintz and striped cotton dresses, though it does seem that they were allowed to wear black silk for christenings and weddings if they were really behaved. But the point is, the fact that they were banned from wearing hoop skirts or colored silk tells you that they had these things and that they were wearing them and apparently wearing them really well. Going back to the Caribbean, one of the most extensive collections of depictions of women of African descent was by this Italian painter, Agostino Brunias. Brunias' paintings are really interesting because they seem to break outside of the European pictorial tradition of only representing black people in order to boast the whiteness of a white female subject. His paintings showcase black people outside of their enslavement and servitude. We see them dancing and socializing and enjoying leisurely activities and living this idyllic island life. It's a very rose-tinted lens on what life would have been like for Africans and their descendants in Dominica. And I've always found this sort of like small comfort in just seeing black people just being. But his paintings served insidious European interests as well. They served to sell continental Europeans this idea that there was harmony and peace and a fineness in the colonies, that the African people were docile and actually really content to labor for them, that they weren't the kinds to try and revolt and rebel against slavery. And it sort of served to work against um, abolitionist movements of the time. And plus, there's also this colorist hierarchy in his artworks. Lighter skinned, white passing and or mixed race women often take the foreground with darker skinned and ambiguous people in the background. The lighter skinned women are often dressed really fashionably and it's only their hard ER counterparts who are shown in the nude or in rags or again in positions of subservience as servants or slaves. The historian K. Diane Prince says of his work, Brunius attempted to promote these newly won colonies as a place where people, as well as raw materials, could be cultivated and refined. Within the context of a nation abolitionist movement, successfully promoting these islands through art had to involve demonstrating the happiness and well-being of the slaves who lived there. Which also actually brings me to something that's always annoyed me for a while. In 2013's Bell, a fictionalized take on the life of Dido Bell, Dido, played by Gugum Bataro, seems to only learn about slavery once her white love interest is arguing with her white judge uncle about the purposeful drowning of enslaved people so that white slaveholders could commit insurance for it. So the majority of historical primary sources on Dido's life suggest that she did lead a relatively sheltered life, but I find it difficult and almost kind of insulting to believe that Dido wouldn't have had an idea about slavery or the condition of slavery until like her early 20s when a white man tells her. Like, sure, maybe she wouldn't know the actual like day-to-day -day reality of enslaved life or that, you know, the really harsh conditions that enslaved people were enduring. But surely she did understand that one, they existed and that part of their enslavement was kind of determined by their race. I can't imagine or I can't know how many black people she would have interacted with in England because of her position in society and her station and her unique sort of life. But the ones that she probably might have at least seen were probably servants. And that should have been perhaps some sort of indication of the inequality going on. And I can't imagine that the people around her only had really nice things all the time to say about black people. In fact, in the movie itself, one of the only other black characters is the maid to her family. And like, hello, did you guys ever speak? Is Mabel a slave? I beg your pardon? Is Mabel a slave? She is free and under our protection. Oh, like me. And also, Dido did only arrive in England at the age of five. She did actually spend her early years in the Caribbean uh, before her mother, who was an enslaved woman, Maria Bell, had died. 
and i just wanted didn't she have some sort of memory of the conditions at the time didn't she see people like working the land or like living a certain kind of life plus we also know that like from historical records that even though she was cared for and loved for for by her family like race and racism was actually a looming shadow of her life like she did actually have to interact with this she is a mulatto she explicitly wasn't allowed to sit at the dinner table with her family as soon as they had guests over like it was a known understanding that they couldn't bring her around polite company plus also her un white uncle that i had just mentioned who she like lived with and grew up with was in real life the lord chief justice of england and he actually had made one of the judgments that would later help propel britain's later abolition movement so dido would have known about like slavery at this time and she did also spend a lot of time assisting him with clerical work and like doing his dictation so she would have read his files and his papers and been much more acutely aware of what was going on i can't imagine she's just this oblivious like little girl who just like found out one day by accident i don't know i guess i guess that's also part of why i'm I'm so transfixed or I've been so enamored with Dido as a figure for so long because that like, she is this historical novelty and it seems to me that even when people are like celebrating her or acknowledging her, no one wants to really grant her very much agency. Not over how she was dressed or how she may have chosen to be dressed, not over how she was portrayed or what she may have known and what have like what she may have felt. And I feel like there is this overlap in the period of Dido's existing living life and when Agostino Brunio's paintings are made. And yeah, again, this is probably more conjecture, but at this point, we're, we're too far gone, right? But considering that she was a pretty well-educated and cultured gentlewoman, I'd like to imagine that she may have come into contact with some of these images, especially because they would have been sent back to like European countries to promote this idea of like docile happy slavery and for that reason I'd also like to think that the clothing depicted in these images may have had some sort of influence on her and continuing on my conspiracy theory bolt here there's also this like thread here about how Marie Antoinette had popularized the chemise a la reine which is this white cotton dress which was inspired by the robe a la creole which is a dress of French women in the Caribbean as well as some of the dress of the African women in the Caribbean because they had to interpret 18th century fashion in a way that could deal with the really hot climate of the Caribbean islands. And that once Marie Antoinette came into contact with this dress and she adopted it and she started wearing it, it really boosted the demand for cotton, which basically developed the American cotton industry, which basically led to chattel slavery that you know we still see lasting effects of and that's essentially like it's so funny how this one sort of dress led to or at least contributed so largely to one of the greatest like human crimes human injustices in history um, i know i'm on my dress history conspiracy theory bullshit but i just think there's so many interesting links between like this image of dido and then marie antoinette like wearing this dress and the appropriation of like the black hairstyling and the turbans and how this brings in asia and how this like led to like slavery in america and i feel like if i had to like plot it out like I'd, my wall could look like mike's mike's like pretty little liar's wall but like somehow with less plot holes i think probably with more sensical connections but in the meantime i'm really excited about having this new dress which i didn't make too long luckily and that it's just really cool to me that there's always these interesting connections or these opportunities to learn about people in the past through something as simple as a painting or a dress you really like and i'm really happy to have this and i'm really happy to have like finally ticked something off my list and yeah um but yeah i'd love to hear from you and thank you so much for sitting with me through this this was a weird all over the place rant while you watched me sew a dress so yeah um links source is always as always in the description Bye.